Blog Talk Radio. Hello, world. Welcome once again to Tuesday Talk with Key West Lou. I am your host, Louis Patron. Well, my friends, it's good to be back with you this week. We missed last week. I apologize. Not my fault. Uh, I could not hook up with the studio. The studio had a technical problem, and I never got to make uh I never get, got to give my show, and many of you have communicated with me uh, regarding it. And again, all I can do is apologize, but I'm apologizing for the studio. Many things are happening in the world. Every week, many things are happening in the world. There is no scarcity of topics and issues to discuss on this program. I could do this for 24 hours instead of the brief, quick half hour that I do uh, and I don't know if I cover everything. So let's get into some of the issues tonight. I want to talk about the recovery, the recovery. We have jubilation, exaltation, and excitement coming out of Washington recently. Best numbers ever. The recession is behind us. We are on the road to recovery. Not a, that, To be frank, they're saying we're not totally there, but we're getting there and we're pretty close and everything's very, very much better. Uh, At the onset, please, let me give credit to Obama. He took office, and when he took office in 2008, he had uh, all bad things on the table regarding uh, money and employment, and he has done considerably better under adverse conditions. However, I don't think we are anywhere close to recovery, and as you'll see in a few moments. Right now, what does the government tell us supports their position as to recovery? Well, one thing is they say, and this is true, more jobs were created in November and December than any time else, exceeded whatever the the administration thought would be the number. The only thing that bothers me is, a lot of these jobs are at the McDonald Burger King level, seven fifty, ten dollars an hour, and other businesses, quote unquote industries, that pay people very little money. These are not the jobs. Most of these are not the jobs that were there prior to two thousand eight at thirty and four as much as thirty and forty dollars an hour. So there are more jobs, but they're not as good paying. Number two, the GDP, 5% growth rate. Man, that's terrific. And we keep up at this rate, (laughs) we can't miss, they're telling us. It doesn't impress me. I'll tell you why in a moment. The other, another item is the stock market is the highest ever. It is fantastic the way this market's gone up in the last few years. Most people look at recovery based solely on the stock market. The only trouble is not everyone in this country is into the stock market. Uh, the stock market is primarily for the 1%. It's not for the 99%. The 1%, the people with the money, have enough money to invest and play the game and generally come out ahead because of the knowledge they have as to what's going on in the world. Uh, it is said that right now in this country this past year, 50% of the people were invested in the stock market. However, many of them, most of them are in there, and perhaps some of you are, is because of their 401ks, okay? And you know how it works. You're investing in a certain uh, group of stocks, et cetera. It's done for, by you, for, by your local broker, whom you pay 2%, and then by a New York broker, probably, a Wall Street broker, And quite frankly, I always thought we got this for nothing, all right? I have a 401k. I thought we got the investment money, that 2% going to the local guy covered the whole thing. Well, it doesn't. Studies have come out recently that take the position that anyone with money in a 401k, what they have there at the end is one-third of what was invested. You heard me. One, it looks like a lot of money, though, because you kept it there for a lot of years. But in reality, it is one-third of what you invested. The rest of the money goes to Wall Street. So I'm not impressed that the stock market is the highest ever because it's not helping the people, quote-unquote. It is not helping the 99%. 
They also tell us that unemployment is down to 5%. Fantastic figure. I'm impressed. I don't care what kind of jobs they are when I say I'm impressed with that number. Uh, Obama had a tough one he started. What was it, 10%, 11%? He's done a fantastic job in bringing us down to 5%. There's a problem, though, and this problem existed 10 years ago, 20 years ago with the percentage of unemployment because it worked the same way then. The number is not realistic. The number represents people who are receiving unemployment benefits. There comes a time when the unemployment benefits have run out since 2008. And those people, they fall, they fall off the table. They're not taken into consideration anymore. They have become a shadow society. If you're not getting unemployment benefits, you don't count in determining the percentage. So the 5% in reality is dramatically higher than 5%. Now, again, I don't think we're there yet. I don't even think we're close. And I'm going to share with you the examples I think support my position that we are not close to being out of this recession. Uh, Number one, it was recently announced that a majority of public school children live in poverty. A majority of public school children live in poverty. 51%. First time in 50 years it has exceeded 50%. There is, there is in Albuquerque, New Mexico, a teacher by the name of Sonia Romero Smith. She's a kindergarten teacher, and she recently said, and I quote, when the kindergarten teacher, when they first come in my door in the morning, the first thing I do is take an inventory of immediate needs. Did you eat? Are you clean? A big part of my job is making them feel safe. Now, again, she has 18 children in her kindergarten class, and 14 are eligible for free lunches. 14 of the 18 are eligible for free lunches. Uh, When they come to school, they're dirty. (laughs) She helps them clean up with bathroom wipes and toothbrushes. The kids aren't taught to brush their teeth. All right? And she has a drawer where she keeps, a big drawer where she keeps clean socks, underwear, pants, and shoes. Now, that's a sad commentary. 51% of our public school children live in poverty. She's this Smith woman says it correctly. She's, telling, she's giving us the example of what's happening across the country. Another issue, now I'm staying with children, because if we don't take care of the least of us, we're not doing our job in this world. We must take care of those who are least able to take care of themselves. 16 million public school children are homeless. I repeat, 16 million public school children are homeless. Now, what does this mean? This means they live in the woods, they live in a cardboard box, they live in an abandoned car, and that's their life. Well, they, get, they don't eat as well, and they, they, don't, they haven't got a shower to take, okay? And they've got to get to school, and then they have their problems. Can you imagine we have 16 million public school children homeless? I say as long as we have... 16 million, as long as we have one child homeless, it's wrong. This society has not come back yet. There is not a recovery with 16 million kids out there living in the woods in a cardboard box or an abandoned car. Uh, I want to talk about President Reagan for a moment, because here's another example of why things aren't right. When Reagan took office, for every dollar the people paid in taxes, Corporations paid a dollar and a quarter. The people, quote unquote, paid a buck, and the corporations, their contribution, their payment to taxes, not a contribution, a responsibility was a dollar and a quarter. Today, today, <laughs> this is dramatically different. 20 cents is paid by the corporations for every dollar the people pay in. In other words, for every buck that you pay in, the people pay in, all right? Corporations only pay 20%. It's not like when it was with Reagan. They were paying a buck and a quarter. Uh, And what happens now? We have major corporations don't pay taxes anymore. Look at General Electric. They hide their money in in offshore accounts. Uh, I talked about, uh, I wrote last week, I didn't talk about it. I wrote uh, a newspaper column 
uh, for Conk Life here in Key West uh, two weeks ago. And I talked about the NFL, the National Football League, being tax exempt. Uh, and they've been this way since 1966. Now, how the hell can they be tax exempt? They are, by statute. Congress gave them the right. Listen to me. The office, the National Football League office, I'm not talking about the teams, they, their revenue every year has been steady. $9.5 billion. The revenue of the National Football League office is $9.5 billion. $9.5 billion. They pay no taxes on their money. At the same time, their commissioner, Robert Goodell, he gets paid $44 million a year out of that money. He pays taxes on his $44 million, but overall, the National Football League office does not pay any taxes on the $9.5 million. Wrong! Corporations have to pay their fair share also. Let's go to food stamps. These are all items to prove the recovery isn't there yet, not even close. 46 million people a month are on food stamps. 46 million Americans are on food stamps every month. This number has remained steady since 2011. That, you know, for, for, that's a big number, 46 million. That's 14.5% of the population, 14.5%. That means 22 million households are on food stamps. We should be proud of this, 22 million households on food stamps. You know, they say business is good. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Business is only good for big business. It's not good for small business. Our economy is divided into two parts, big business, small business. Prior to 2008, small business employed two-thirds of the working people in this country, Small business is always, it's always been said, they employ more people than the big corporations. Two-thirds of the working people were in small businesses, all right, prior to 2008. Well, it's not that way anymore. Big business is part of the recovery. We know the corporations are getting richer. We know CEOs and, and staff at the top are earning millions of dollars a year, some in excess of a million dollars. Can you imagine making that kind of money? Getting bonuses year-end, $20 million, $40 million, big numbers. And the small businesses, they're not back. They're only about halfway back. And so they're not employing two-thirds of our society anymore because small business has not recovered. And to me, that's another sign that the recession is not over. It's nowhere close to being over. And I'll take this position. The economy cannot thrive unless small businesses do also. They are an integral part of our economic picture. I want to talk about an inconsistency. I'm going to talk about Congress because I'm going to tell you something right now. I don't understand a lot of things that Washington does. I, I say this also. I, I, I believe that indirectly they are on the take they are owned by corporate America. Fantastic amounts of money are put into their, their, their funds for when they have to run again, uh, into their political funds. How can they not do, you know, major corporations bidding? If you're getting $250,000 from this one, a half a million from this one, 750000 from that one, you're, you're getting it because you're supporting that position of that big corporation. You're helping them. They want something, and you're delivering or you're going to deliver. I'm not talking about that, though. This is the inconsistency in Washington. Right now, Congress is deciding whether to declare war on ISIS. The president has asked for permission or authorization, because Congress provides the money, uh, to declare war on ISIS. It is anticipated that Congress will approve this. They're diddling around with it for the last 10 days or so. But in due course and very shortly to anticipate, Congress will give the per per uh, permission and authorize, authorize giving the president the authority to declare war on ISIS, and we are going to be at war with ISIS. At the same time, this is what I don't understand. At the same time, they're considering 
declaring war and in all likelihood are going to declare war, Congress is refusing to fund the Department of Homeland Security. Now, who is our first line of defense or decides where they're going to strike next, if they're going to strike here, what we should do to prevent these strikes by ISIS, what we have to do in the event one of these attacks takes place. It's all in the Department of Homeland Security's hands. Well, for political reasons, I'm not going to go into them. Some of you are familiar with them. The Congress refuses to outright fund the Department of Homeland Security. They've been adding kickers on to the bill, and it's getting no place. Money runs out February 28th. After February 28th, the Department of Homeland Security has to start laying people off. Now, does it make sense to you that they won't fund Homeland Security, but they'll fund the war? Don't, I don't get it. All right, now we're going to go to Greece. Greece, let me tell you something right now. Greece is where everything is happening in this world. It's not happening in the Middle East, really. It's not happening with ISIS. The most, because there's an economic war here right now. I'm not talking about a blood war. And this war can bring down, could put all of Europe in recession. And if there's a recession in Europe that way, it's going to come across the Atlantic to the United States. Right now, Greece and Germany are in a fight to the death. Greece and Germany. Understand, Euro Union, 17 nations. Uh, Germany is one of them, but Germany's a kingpin. Germany invested the most money in the Euro Union when they went into the Euro. It's mostly Germany's money that's loaned to Greece. And when Greece cannot pay back or does not pay back, Germany hurts because they may, were making tons of money five years ago, but they're on the brink of recession today. They must be paid or they're going to topple over the edge of the cliff. Well, you have a new party in Greece. Uh, the Syriza party, far left, radical to the left, just as somebody's to the right of the Tea Party, that's very radical. Uh, same thing on the left, on the liberal side. Well, the Syriza party that was going no place before this election now controls, okay? And they have the new prime minister and all the officers. They want to get rid of the euro debt. You have to understand, uh, the president, the prime minister, ran, who just got elected three weeks ago, uh, Alex Tsipras, T-S-I-P-R-A-S. I still haven't got his name correctly. I'm sorry. He told them, we're not going to pay the debt off. <laughs> we're not going to pay it off. Screw them. Screw Germany. This is the way they talk. Uh, they shouldn't, they say we shouldn't have borrowed the money. They shouldn't have loaned it to us. They knew we couldn't pay it back. It was obvious we didn't have the financial means to pay it back. Uh, they've told everyone your taxes went up since 2008, your real property taxes. He's going to give everybody in Greece the money back that they paid in for taxes since 2008, which has been overwhelming because the taxes have gone up three, four times every year to pay back Germany and the Euro Union, based on the austerity Germany and the Euro Union uh, imposed upon Greek, Greece. The Germans, you have to understand this, are hard-ass bankers. They are behaving and acting like hard-ass bankers. Uh, just think if you've ever been turned down for a loan, especially when you need it, uh, or you didn't get approval for something. Germany sits in that chair today, and it's dealing with people as if they were bankers. Now, the Greeks don't care. I spent a lot of time in Greece, as, you, as most of you well know. I've written about this. Uh, great people. I love the Greek people. I, I, I can't wait to go back this year. I love Greece. Wonderful place. But the, the people are great, and that's what makes it, makes it wonderful. You have to understand, the Greeks... Right now, today, their anti-German fever, they don't like the Germans, is the highest it has ever been, I read somewhere this past week, that it can't get any higher. The, the Greeks cannot hate the Germans any more than they do now because Chancellor Merkel of Germany, she insists they got to pay back every penny and on time. They, the Greeks also remember World War II. Germany occupied Greece during the war. Germany was tough on these people, did a lot of bad things to the Greek people. And let me tell you, it's like the Civil War. A lot of people never forget. There are people in the South, 
that still remember the Civil War. Well, World War II was closer, and the Greek people remember how they were treated during that war. There were, they had one moment of glory in the war. That was Crete, the island of Crete. When the Germans parachuted in their stormtroopers and everything else, the people on the island put up such a fight that it took days before the Germans could take over this little island. They lost. They lost the battle for Crete, but in their minds to this day, they believe they won that battle because it took so long for Germany to occupy them. And their cry today is, remember Crete, we can put up the fight, but this time we are actually going to win. Now, things are happening in Germany that affect them and make, mean they've got to get their money. There's a, there are many anti-Muslim riots in Germany. When's the last time you heard? in Germany. You have it. Why not? Because our media doesn't doesn't report these things. I have to go to the, you know, the British Airways to find out what's going on. There are many, many anti-Muslim riots uh, and things aren't good and we don't hear about it and that bothers me. The Germany, this is going to shock the hell out of you, Germany has become increasingly anti-Semitic. It's against the law in Germany to be anti-Semitic, but the people are becoming, I don't know why, increasingly anti-Semitic. This is a problem worldwide, though, worldwide. Most nations in Europe, if not all of them, have are anti-Semitic today, more so than they were 10 years ago. There's more anti-Semitism in the United States. It was recently announced that more and more people from Europe and the United States are leaving their home countries and immigrating to Israel to live because they fear this growing anti-Semitism. These are all the things that are going on in Germany. Now, what's Greece going to do? Greece has to come up with, if they don't pay the bill, the the Euro Union is going to take them off the Euro. They don't care. They're going to let this happen or come damn close to it. They either go back to the money they had before the euro, which was called the drachma. That won't work, I don't think, because you've got to have a national currency, but you've got to have something backing it up so it's a solid currency. The drachma is going to have as much money in the bank as the country of Greece, which means zip, nothing. I think, I think that the Greeks, you know, they... They don't pay the bill. They're out of the Euro Union. They're off the Euro. I think they're going to declare the national currency to be the American dollar. And it can be done. Other countries do this. The American dollar is strong. We may not think so because of what we're going through, but the American uh, dollar is very, very strong. And this gives them a buck to work with that is a good dollar. It's a real dollar, whereas the drachma would not be a valid uh, drachma. So keep your eye on Greece. A lot going up there. And I'm going to stay with Greece once more. The Prime Minister, Alexis Tsipras, and his cabinet uh, have been all over Europe in, in the last two or three weeks since the Syriza party got elected. Uh, and they're showing, I think, <laughs> they're insulting the hell out of everybody they meet. Uh, number one, the Prime Minister, he goes tieless. I've never seen him wear a tie. He wears a suit, but he never has a tie. The finance minister was in uh, in a meeting in Berlin last week. A photo was taken with him and his counterpart uh, in the German government. Uh, The the finance minister of Germany wore a suit, shirt, and tie. And the finance minister of Greece, the new finance minister, had on an open-collar sports shirt. It was not tucked into his pants, and he wore a billowy leather coat. Now, I think this isn't a new style they're imposing. I think this is to show disrespect. And I'm not arguing with them. They're saying to Germany and everybody else in the world, we stand on our own now. We're going to make our own rules. And if you don't like them, the hell with you. You know, we're going to play it our way now because playing it your way hasn't worked. So I think it's, they're saying basically up yours, okay? Disrespect. Let's go to Venezuela here quickly. Venezuela, I've been talking about them. I've been writing about them for for three years. First, they had a shortage of uh, 
of uh, toilet paper, then a shortage of milk. They still got shortages in all these things, by the way. Uh, no soap, no shampoo. I don't know what, what else. So many things they, they can't provide. Things you normally buy every week when you go to the supermarket. And now, guess what? It has been announced they have a shortage of condoms. Now, this isn't a joke, and you'll understand why in a second. And if you want to buy condoms, you have to buy a package of 36, if they're available, for $755. That's a lot of money. That's $21 a condom. Uh, in a country that's almost as poor as Greece, okay, the people don't have any money. Let me say, too, that the average monthly earnings of a Greek citizen is $755. So it costs a month's earning in order to uh, buy condoms. Now, why do they need the condoms? Because Venezuela is undergoing at the present time an, a great HIV epidemic. That condoms are necessary to life to prevent a furtherance of the disease, and they can't get condoms. I want to stay with Venezuela a second. Further, also, uh, they had it made with Hugo Chavez. Now they got Maduro, uh, President Maduro. The last time I was on, two weeks ago, I said that Maduro was telling the world, making announcements that Vice President Biden was leading a coup against his government. And that President Obama did not know that, and he was going to make Obama aware. Well, this past week, he said that a coup was put down. The coup was led by the United States. With the support of Great Britain and Canada, they foiled it. They defended democracy in Venezuela. And how do they know? Because they, they grabbed these computers in their country that the bad guys had, and these computers had detailed coup plans including maps showing targets to be bombed, you know, with the U.S. imprint, Great Britain and Canada's imprint on them. Certain generals have been fired and jailed. Certain people arrested and jailed. They have confessed, confessed that they were with the United States on this issue, supported by our government. And he also says, Maduro, I have the support of the president of Nicaragua. Well, you know who the president of Nicaragua is. It's Daniel Ortega. Maduro's a nut. I keep saying that. I don't know why the people haven't rebelled. They don't have free elections, actually. They're not free. The people have to rebel. I don't know why they put up with all this. They don't have anything, and they put up with this stuff. He's just like Castro. Castro, Castro survived 50 years, always being on the defensive, saying the United States was going to... Uh, was going to... Uh, going to Cuba. I was going to attack Cuba, invade Cuba. Uh, very quickly, I want to talk about a PBA, this time in St. Louis, Missouri, which is right next door to Ferguson, where uh, Michael Brown was killed. Okay, the black fellow who was shot by a white police officer. Uh, St. Louis is concerned, as many cities are, and the entire commission, they're in unison on this, their Common Council, City Commission, and the mayor are in the process of adopting a local law which will provide for a civilian oversight board to overlook what the police do and investigate things. And guess what the police said? You do that and we're going to quit or we're going to have a work slowdown. We're not going to do our job. We're not going to make as many arrests. We're not going to give out parking tickets. They've got the audacity, the testicles to say, we're not going to do anything if you do this. You know, it's, it's the old story of the tail wagging the dog. It's not right. You don't do this in this country. And I, they're going to get, the PBA has to lose on this. Remember, a, remember Reagan with the controllers? He fired 11,000 in two days because they did not come back to work. That's the show for this week. Thank you for joining me. You, a lot of you read, uh, listen to this archive, Facebook and YouTube, but wherever, whenever, I'm glad you joined me. Remember, I have a book. You can buy it on it. You can purchase it on Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. The World Upside Down by Lewis or Key West Lou. The World Upside Down. If you enjoyed the show, you will enjoy my book. If you don't enjoy the show, you will not enjoy my book. Don't buy it. Nice being with you again. I look forward to sharing time with you next week.